Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We are so glad you're with us today to stay curious. We got on our green screen today, we've got the Mir Space Station, which is somewhere in the middle of the Indian Ocean now, but it had about a 15-year legacy that included the U.S. Space Shuttle, and we're going to talk today about the first docking with the Mir Space Station, a huge, huge event uh, back in the day in 1995 and uh this was also something that had started because of the international cooperation that was started with the apollo soyuz test project in 1975 20 years later uh russian and americans are living together momentarily on the mirror space station we had a swap out of seven crewmen quite a history of this wonderful uh, in many ways uh space station that did a lot to document and put the uh, the timeline as well as, as the bedrock i'm trying to say for our international space station in cooperation with russians today you got to remember that orbit into earth are three russians three americans and a an astronaut from the united arab emirates and uh we're happy that people can get along in space where they might not be able to get along on earth so we also got a, a real important show uh, for Flight of Columbia to talk about here today, but want to say hi to Marty Winkle in our Streamlabs computer today. Marty, good to see you back in the helm. And uh, he's there writing down names of all you that are checking in today. Sorry to be a few minutes late today, but that's my fault. Kind of got time got away from me as I was uh, massaging today's program. So let's kick it off with our Streamlabs slideshow here. 11 beautiful shuttles in the month of May of June. And the last one right there is STS-71 we're going to talk about. And STS-4, the last flight, uh, technically test flight of a shuttle. And um, we'll talk about there, you know, I'm going to talk about the mission emblems and the history behind that. But let's look at these 11 shuttles. The first docking is was launched June 27th, 1995. The last docking was June 2nd, 1998. So a three-year span there of dockings, uh, very important to the relations of, the, of America and Russia, as well as important to what's going on in the International Space Station today. The Russians pioneered space stations. They taught us a lot about them. And uh, we're going to see in a minute the first space station launched uh, here at the end of June in 1975, I believe, or, or 71, actually. A um, couple of the other missions, we're going to have Mikey Haddad, our payloads expert, is going to be on and talk about STS-40. Uh, with That crew included three women and it did a, a life science lab, very important. So we're going to look forward to Mikey Haddad being on Stay Curious tomorrow. And Wednesday, Thursday, we're going to have Terry White and Terry's uh, son, uh, Travis, who is a military man and has watched his dad do Stay Curious programs while he was in Iraq. So we're going to look forward to father and son on Thursday. And Friday, we've got a rocket engineer from Devaya Space going to come our local hometown rocket company via space. We've got uh, a, a young engineer who's gonna tell us about the propulsion systems that's being used for this low earth orbit rocket booster that's made out of plastic and uses plastics as its fuel. So we got three great programs lined up. Tomorrow, Wednesday is gonna be Mikey Haddad, payloads of the shuttle, including the STS-40 up there, the triangular hatch. Uh, Wednesday, Terry White, who's the garage manager of the shuttles, we call him. And then via space, our hometown rocket company on Friday. So that makes it easier on me, uh, Marty, as you well know, because all I have to do is throw out a few intros and try to shut up and let our guests talk. So as we're looking at the beautiful shuttles of the month of June, it included uh, nine of the 11 missions had women on board, 68 crewmen, 15 of them were women. That 22% is one of the highest <clears throat> ratio of any month as we break them down. Uh, several astronauts went up twice. 
uh, during the month of uh, June. Uh, 116 days all the, uh, spent by all five shuttle orbiters. Usually we think Discovery, the workhorse of the shuttle era, would have the most, but Columbia had four of its missions in the month of June. Uh, Challenger, one of its 10 missions. Uh, Discovery had two, Atlantis two, and uh, Endeavor two. And while we're talking about uh, Atlantis being launched today in space history, the 10th anniversary of it being uh, mothballed and put at Kennedy Space Center is going to be tomorrow. And Marty and I were talking about, no, it's Thursday, I take it back. Thursday, and uh, Marty and I were seeing some of the astronauts like Mike Mullane is going to be there, Bill Riley, um, uh, Baker, uh, Bill Shepard is going to be there, our, our commander of the first International Space Station crew, and um, the lady out there, Marty, um, trying to think. Yeah, well, I left my sheet over there. Anyway, if, you have, if you're in the area, that'll be a fun thing to go to. And Marty and I were talking about going out there and celebrating the 10th anniversary of Atlantis being uh, a museum exhibit. And it is a fabulous view of Atlantis when you have the reveal of that. So, well, we're going to kick it off as we're talking about the mirror. Here is the, here, there is the, the mirror space station is behind me uh, in its full glory there. Really, uh, it's 15 years. Looks like a mismatch of, of, of modules, and it basically was. Uh, there was a fire on board, a collision, uh, and uh, nobody lost their lives. So that's a good thing. And we'll talk about those events here in just a minute. But first, we're going to launch off Columbia on its fourth mission. Technically, a Department of Defense mission was the final space transportation system research and development flight, in addition to its classified DOD payload that one of the astronauts called a, uh, let's see, he didn't call it a joke, he called it a, uh, uh, what was it? It was kind of mocked a little bit. Um, a rinky-dink collection of minor stuff they wanted to fly is what uh, Ken Mattingly, the commander and former moonwalker, moon, moon uh, orbiter, I say, on Apollo 10 said about that classified payload. Uh, so there's a beautiful launch. It occurred at exactly 11 a.m. on this date, June 27, 1982, the first time the space shuttle launched precisely on its scheduled launch time. Marty, I think that's pretty good. Uh, four missions, and they got down to the instant there. I didn't ask you before the show. I know you were a space launch systems uh, uh, manager working on those engines. That was probably a pretty good feather in everybody's cap to get it off at exactly on time, right? Yeah, it is on every mission when you get it off on time. True, good. Well, Marty, speaking to us on the UCAC family, family microphone there. Um, well, or, uh, it was OV-102 Columbia, that's its tail number, Orbital Vehicle 102, <clears throat> launched exactly 11 a.m. Ken Mattingly is the commander, uh, and uh, Henry Hartsfeld, who's deceased, is the pilot. Ken Mattingly is 87 years old. This was the fourth and final test flight mission for Columbia and marked the first time, like I said, that it launched exactly on time. At the end of the shuttle era in July 2011 with the 135th launch uh, happening and the 133rd safe landing nasa insiders admitted that the 30-year program was basically an experimental spacecraft during its entire lifespan uh, but uh, what an experiment it was of course uh, let's talk about as i love to the symbolism and meaning of these mission logos this is one of my favorite ones marty too it's very simple i like its simplicity and i love its patriotic colors there this oval shaped artwork is in the is the insignia for the fourth sts flight in nasa's space transportation system the insignia shows columbia trailing our nation's colors in the shape of the flight number a four representing the fourth and final flight of the highly successful flight test phase of the orbiters. Columbia then streaks on into the future, entering the exciting operational 
phase scheduled to begin with STS-5. So uh, that's why the shuttle's kind of piercing itself off the oval there to reach, to go into the future. And Marty, I know that, you know, for, shot, for the shuttle missions, but I think every maiden flight of the other four orbiters was just, who. You know, it was the maiden flight of a brand new vehicle going to space. It's not like driving a car off the assembly line in, in Detroit and, and knowing that all the wheels are going to stay on it and the windows work and stuff. So I kind of think of the, every maiden flight was just, uh, but NASA, you know, Marty, and you were part of it, they, they really took it just like the next flight in line and didn't make a big deal about this maiden flight of a new orbiter. But... Uh, uh, it just goes to show you the testimony of the space workers uh, like uh, our Stay Curious co-producer Marty and all the thousands of people like him that worked hard and diligent and, 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 and knew that always lives were at stake no matter what they did there. So that's the emblem of STS-4. Uh, there is the payload, the first time that they flew uh, kind of a uh, uh, a lab on in, in there. There's... Uh, uh, Ken Mattingly, who's 87, and Henry Hartsfeld. Henry died at age 80, so he lived a good long life. I forgot to look up how many missions Hartsfeld had. I think he had a couple more uh, in there. Uh, bad on me uh, to not know that. But uh, And here they are in the cockpit uh, of the uh, shuttle orbiter there. Uh, that, uh, you know, is a familiar territory to a lot of astronauts as that was the, the first one working up in there. You looking up Hartsfeld for me there, Marty? Yeah. Thank you, I sir. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, he, he was a, a, a really nice man, people say. Um, when this mission ended, as you see, they're sitting on ejection seats, okay? Uh, the ejection seats were deactivated. I think they were very similar to ejection seats of the Blackbird uh, SR-71 uh, uh, spy jet. Uh, Hartsfield had uh, four missions total? Three, three missions. Three. So three. I bet he was commander of the other two because mm -hmm. once you're a pilot, and then, then you segue into commander, but those early shuttle guys, so... Hartsfeld, this is his first of three. The first getaway special was in the payload that had nine scientific experiments provided by students from University of U uh, Utah, U Utah State University. So, uh, like I said, Mattingly kind of mocked the two sensors for detecting missile launches. They were classified in the payload bay, calling them, quote, rinky dink collection of minor stuff they wanted to fly. Uh, and uh, the payload failed to operate, Department of Defense. So uh, in its mid-deck was the continuous flow electrophoresis system uh, that Charlie Walker flew to space three times. Marty, I texted Charlie Walker last night, our good friend that uh, we've ate a couple of dinners with, and told him I was in my backyard shooting the moon with a telescope. I was doing a little moon gazing last night, and, and uh, Charlie's texted me back well i'm looking at the same moon you're looking at mark so he was in arizona 113 orbits of earth columbia landed on july 4th okay uh, at 9 10 a.m pacific time on the first concrete runway uh, out there at edwards air force base and marty that was very well remembered because um president Reagan was there with his wife, Nancy, and they greeted the crew upon arrival. And following the landing, Reagan gave a speech and then uh, declared the space shuttle operational. And uh, then after his remarks, the new shuttle Challenger atop the shuttle carrier aircraft 747 flew over the landed uh, Columbia and uh, President Reagan there in 1980, 1982, July 4th. So... I uh, think I'll post some memories of that on July 4th. Yeah, Marty. Yeah, Hartsfield was the commander of his last two missions, and he flew on 41D as commander. That was the Judy Resnick Legs picture mission. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, great. And Mike Good. Mullane was on that mission. And also. Mike Mullane was on that mission. So thank you. Yeah, once a pilot, twice a commander. Henry Hartsfield lived to a good age of 80 years old. So uh, we, we love remembering about them. And so let's go into a little bit of, uh, as, as we're looking at these guys, and then we're going to talk about the Mir Space Station as it's docking, about the dock. Actually, this is the, dis, uh, 
the undocking of it um, from Atlantis uh, on this mission. Uh, the boom going out to the right is how they raise the orbit. That actually has a thruster on that, uh, that big boom out there. Uh, but this space station would not have been possible had it not been for the world's first space station, Salyut 1, that was occupied by these three astronauts who unfortunately lost their life uh, in uh, the first true, well, the second space fatality. Russia had the first one with uh, uh, cosmonaut Korolev being tangled up in his chutes and crashed at 500 miles an hour. Just a horrible thing back in 1968. But this was Soyuz 11, and the crew here, George Dabrowski, Vladov Volkov, and Viktor Patoskiv, uh, there, um, they docked with the world's face, first space station, shown right here, a picture that they took when they departed uh, on June 29th. All right, the mission ended in disaster when the crew capsule depressurized during preparations for re-entry, killing the through man, man crew. They were asphyxiated, okay, and the cosmonauts uh, were given a large state funeral. We'll look at that in a minute, but this is the world's first space station from film that was damaged uh, after uh, th they had re-entered uh, the Earth's atmosphere in a crack. Uh, when they depressurized the vehicle, uh, a crack opened up uh, like a quarter of an inch, one of the valves. All the air went out. They were not wearing spacesuits. They were uh, just in these flight fatigues, just like our first 25 space shuttle astronauts flew, not in pressurized suits, but just in comfortable flight gear. Had they been wearing helmets and flight suit, they would have survived. But they spent 22 days in space in 1971, and that was not broken until 1973, uh, just in June of uh, 73, by our first Skylab astronauts who stayed up there for 28 days, uh, beating that record set by these unfortunate astronauts that lost their lives. A state funeral was held with a burial in the Kremlin Wall Necropolis at Red Square near the remains of Yuri Gagarin in uh, Korolev, uh, who lost his name. Uh, uh, I mean, Komarov is the, Korolev's the secret rocket designer. Komarov was the cosmonaut that lost his life. U.S. astronaut Tom Stafford was one of the pallbearers. Uh, all these gentlemen, they're shown uh, deceased there. Uh, they, they were in perfect shape. Uh, uh, they just asphyxiated. Uh, Craters on the moon named after them. A group of hills on Pluto is also named the Soyuz Hills. So uh, uh, that's a very tragic day for Russia. That happened on June 29th, 1971. Well, let's look at a happy day for Russia and America, and that would be the... Uh, Atlas, uh, when, Atl uh, when Atlantis was launched in 1995, uh, this launch, STS-71, was launched at 3.32 uh, in the afternoon. Atlantis roaring off launch pad 39 at Kennedy Space Center with a veteran crew of five, all right. Uh, but it would return to space, Kennedy Space Center 10 days later with eight occupants on it. And that, in, that necessitated a couple of uh, space age lawn chairs to be built that we have one here in our museum that I'm going to show you here in a few minutes. STS-71, let's look at the, the, uh, the symbolism here of it here in just a minute. But it marked many historic firsts in human space flights. It was the 100th U.S. human launch conducted from Cape Kennedy. Uh, this is, uh, again, 1995. The first U.S. Space Shuttle Russian space station docking in joint on-orbit operations. The largest spacecraft ever in orbit, the shuttle and the uh, Mir space station combined. The first on-orbit change out of the shuttle crew and 10 humans in orbit the Earth. So what a big deal for the two superpowers, okay, to dock together. This The docking actually happened at 9 a.m., June 29th, 1995, when uh, Atlantis closed in with Commander Hoot Gibson, his uh, fourth of fifth flights, doing the driving 
I mean, it's his fifth and last flight for Hoot Gibson there uh, uh, as commander of this. So that had to be a thrilling way for Hoot to go out. I'd love to ask him about that someday. Um, and Mir's first American occupant, Norm Thagard, was brought back with two other Russian cosmonauts. And that eight-person landing had been done with STS-61A in 1985. The first, uh, spa uh, uh, it was a, uh, I think it was a German mission, or it was a space lab with a lot of Europeans on it for sure. So here is that crew. Oh no, let me get back to the uh, book report here from the Mission Patch Handbook that you should all have in your library. SCS seventy one. This is a beautiful patch, and and you're and why? Because space artist Robert McCall designed this patch. All right, and uh, we love talking about our space artist, Chris Cali, his father, Paul. Chris is a friend of our museum. We feature his artwork all the time, as well as his father, Paul, who is a great friend of Robert McCall. They had a, a fun uh, uh, time uh, challenge each other with their, their artwork. McCall definitely stuck to space art. And the patch depicts Atlantis in the process of the first international docking mission of the space shuttle with Mir. Names of the 10 astronauts and cosmonauts who will fly aboard Atlantis are shown along the border. The rising sun symbolizes, in the middle there, symbolizes the dawn of a new era of cooperation between the two countries. Atlantis and Mir are shown in separate circles converging in the center, symbolizing the merger of the space station, of the space programs of each country. The flags of the U.S. and Russia emphasize the equal partnership of the mission. The joint program symbol at the lower center represents um, the extensive contributions made by both countries in their mission control centers there. The patch was designed by space artist Robert McCall, who also designed the patch for the Apollo-Soyuz test project in 1975, the first international docking in space. So how appropriate is that? Uh, other astronauts, uh, Coop Gibson, Charlie Precourt was making his first flight as a pilot. Charlie would visit the, spa the Mir Space Station two more times as a commander, and his birthday is Thursday, so we're going to feature Charlie here at the end of our program a little bit. Ellen Baker was up there, Bonnie Dunbar, Greg Harbaugh was the other mission specialist, and uh, then three cosmonauts involved in that with Norm Thagard. So here's the whole bunches of them uh must have posed for this before the flight i think when they were in training uh you got the russians uh uh hope gibson's in the middle okay and uh where is um i was looking for um oh yeah uh, the pilots in the back up there um yeah that's kind of different to have the pilot up there in the back uh, Ellen Baker was on her third and last space flight. All right, she's got the afro there in the middle. Greg Harbaugh on his third of four. Bonnie Dunbar on her fourth of five missions there. She's on the far right there. So an experienced crew going to the Mir Space Station on this date in 1995, 28 years ago. All right, and uh, let's look at it a little bit here. As I said, um, Thagard came back with two other cosmonauts in this uh, chair there. Uh, should have shot that horizontally, but it looks like a lawn chair, and we have that on top of our space shuttle launch uh, consoles there, and there's Thagard's name there. He signed it up the upper left, but this was the chair that was uh, f literally folded in the back. They had three of these to bring back the other uh, cosmonauts. There is Norm Thagard and the Mir Space Station. Uh, showing off his uh, flight uh, fatigues there, his flight uh, blue uniform there. Um, and here is the Atlantis docked with the Mir Space Station. Look at how our orbiter dwarfs that station. It's amazing. But they've got like five different modules attached there, uh, basically like a bunch of... Uh, uh, high-end trailers hooked together there and how was this picture taken you may ask so was not by a spacewalking astronaut it was by the crew 
of the Mir space station that was occupying it at the time. They got into their Soyuz and kind of taxied out to take the picture. They didn't want anything happening to the space station, uh, their space station while they were on board there that could happen because of the undocking. But, uh, uh, well, what did happen was they got a master alarm and had to uh, quickly uh, go back in uh, while Gibson had undocked, both spacecraft uh, uh, were undocked from the mirror. The space station suffered a computer malfunction and started to drift in att attitude. So the mirror 19 crew had to perform a hasty redocking monitored by Atlantis, and they replaced the computer hardware. Uh, so it was kind of an unopportune time to have an emergency uh, with nobody on board, and they had to quickly dock back with it. So. Uh, but you didn't know that about this uh, mirror docking. So here's a look inside of uh, one of those sections uh, where that three of the, they go off in the different areas there. Uh, problem was keeping fans going and the circulation of the air because you're in space and uh, you're weightless. And so air and, and, and gas and so forth can pool in one area if you don't have fans moving around. Plus all these, all of those um, hoses there, like air ducts, they're exactly air ducts supplying air from other areas into the, into the module. But there's one above, you're looking at three, and one where the picture is. So you got five different, <laughs> a five-way exit there. Which way do I go? Which way do I go? And that was one of the problems with the mirror was it was quite cluttered with a lot of cables and air hoses and just just everything that they, they couldn't close these when they had an accident. Uh, it created a problem. There's Jerry Leninger. They actually had a fire on board when he was there. He's holding up one of the oxygen candles, they call them, that were burned to create oxygen. And that's a common thing to add oxygen uh, on a... Uh, on the Mir space station, the Salyut space stations, and it actually caught fire while Leninger was up there. And then you see the damage to the uh, solar panels there on the left. That was caused by a cargo ship that crashed into the Mir space station. Well, I think David Wolf was on board. Uh, this was caused by a cosmonaut that didn't have enough training, and he was simply trying to get a bonus. And like a, he had a, a controls, uh, joystick controls, and and didn't have any visual sight of this, and actually had the other occupants, a cosmonaut and David Wolf, trying to say how close, how close is it, and he miscalculated, and they were lucky it didn't hit broadly. But this is the Spectre module that Wolf was living in. And, uh, uh, you know, it, nobody, you know, it depressurized it and they could never use that module again. Um, close call. And, but we learned a lot, again, about uh, uh, even emergency procedures. Well, at the American Space Museum, we are fond of all kinds of memorabilia. Let me get a, sorry to yawn there. Let me get a quick drink. From this mission, we have come across cards from time to time that are given to you, the Space Geek, that has payload bayliner in it from Atlantis that docked with the Mir space station. That's always a cool thing to sell or have, as well as a coin that uh, was given to uh, space workers. Uh, I think, Marty, you were involved with giving, did you, did you get one of these coins? They were a nice little uh, certificate and were given to uh, lots of people. And uh, the coin says this on the back. This medallion commemorates international cooperation uh, in space, contains metal from the U.S. Space Shuttle Atlantis and the Russian Space Station Mir. So, like I said, 10 years, they're going to celebrate Thursday, Atlantis being a museum relic here. Or, and it's a beautiful museum relic. It certainly is gorgeous. But... Uh, uh, 28 years ago, it was docked to the Russian space station mirror. As right there is the undocking of it. As uh, Hoot Gibson performed that, and then quickly those cosmonauts had to get back in, and hopefully that they could dock to a space station that was starting to move away from them, Marty. So that had to be something exciting. So we thank everyone for watching today. Doug Forrest, Cynthia Rossi, Gary Gerald, Robert Law.
Hazel Banks, Carlton Bailey, all great fans. There's Bill Whiting watching here in uh, Florida. Litza Della Porta, thank you. And Space Monkeys watching. Flat Rock 74 is in Tennessee. Okay, Flat Rock, back in my adopted uh, state. And the Code Blue Collective, all right? Don't hit a Code Blue yet. We've had a good day on our Streamlabs presentation, haven't we, Marty? Well, I wanted to give a shout out to this man that visited the space station three or the Mir space station three times. I would love for him to come out there and talk to him about it, Marty. This, of course, is Charlie Precourt. He was born June 29th, just a couple days from now, 1955, in Waltham, Massachusetts. Considers Hudson, Massachusetts, to be his hometown as he graduated from Hudson High School. There he is giving a talk. I've seen him running around the Space Center during some of the, the uh, well, when we had the Astronaut Hall of Fame was here. He was here for that. Um, he uh, uh, still an aviator, retired from NASA in 2004 after being a pilot on one shuttle and a commander of three. Those three go into the, I mean, a pilot of two and a commander of uh, two. Uh, and three of those two, he went to the International Space Station three of those four missions, I believe. And uh, so he's a uh, really, he was very involved with Russian-U.S. space relations, okay? There's Charlie in the commander's seat there. Um, so I'll bet, you know, he's constantly, you know, with, with what goes on up there at the space station, hope he is involved with that up there. But he was involved with the, uh, relations there at Star City and served as the astronaut chief of the astronaut office for four years. All right, he retired as a gen as a colonel in the U.S. Air Force. There he is on the Mir Space Station, Charlie floating around there. So, uh, uh, so we'd love to talk to him someday about his experience on the space station, as he's one of the few people that have been there. I need to work up a program just on the uh, Russian Mir. Uh, all of the uh, stories we can get out of it there. So, uh, but we're going to be wishing Charlie a happy 68th birthday on Facebook Thursday. Happy birthday today, Charlie. We will have uh, on Thursday Mr. White, Terry White, and his son Travis will be in here. And we'll talk to him about that. And tomorrow we got Mikey Haddad. Hey, Mikey, how you doing, buddy? And yes, a grown man, Michael. He said that uh, where he worked in the uh, uh, Space Shuttle Processing Facility and the uh, Orbit, uh, ONC uh, Operations and Checkout Building, there were uh, eight or nine Mikes and Michaels, so he said, call me Mikey. And Mikey, we love you and what you contribute to our museum coming on once a month to talk about the payloads. He's going to be talking about shuttle payloads of STS-40, and he's going to go back to one, uh, a space lab uh, 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 mission there. I forget the number on that, but uh, Mikey's racked up and ready to go, and we can't wait to see you here tomorrow, my friend. Thursday, Terry White, and Friday, Via Space, okay, is going to be in the house, our hometown rocket company, and tell you about how they're building rockets 3d wise out of plastic bottles that you discard so marty we got through a air free stay curious program today and we thank everybody for being along the ride here to watch it and hope that you come back tomorrow as i'm mark marquette saying we can't wait to see you staying curious with us to bridge the space between us